hear me? Okay, that's a, that's a contraption here. Well, let me just say Purim Sameach, if you know what I'm talking about. We're in the season of Purim. Some of you may say that's a post-biblical holiday. Well, no, it uh, was commanded to the Jewish people for every generation uh, without end. And in John 10, 22, you find the Feast of Dedication. And we have one of the greatest lessons on Christology given in that context, uh, based on Jesus' time at the Porch of Solomon at the Feast of Dedication. But Purim is what we're in. Uh, and since we're introducing ourselves now to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are the product of a Jewish sect, a community. And by the way, the book of Esther, which forms the story of Purim, was not found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. My theory is, is because everyone, every family had their own uh, Purim scroll. They use that as part of their celebrations, <coughs> uh, family reading, and the result is that uh, they took them with them. That was not something that was stored away, but uh, be that as it may. Well, let's look this morning, or rather now this afternoon, at the value of the Dead Sea Scrolls for biblical studies. And my goal will be not just to cover the Old Testament, to move into some of the New Testament as well. But there's quite a lot of material. I taught a course uh, recently at uh, Shepherd Seminary on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, just this part here took about 15, 16 hours. So, uh, but we'll abbreviate it a bit tonight. Okay. All right, let's ask the question, what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Uh, it's not like my granddaughter who misunderstood and thought it was the Dead Sea Squirrels. <laughs> and uh, here we were in caves, and she said, did you find any of the Dead Sea Squirrels? And, uh, and actually, I said, yes, we did. We found an animal skeleton at the back of the cave and brought back, I don't know if that's one of them. <clears throat> All right, so what are the Dead Sea Squirrels? Well, just in brief, we look at them. They are a collection of a 1,000 plus documents that were comprised from 11 caves where they were discovered. They are the oldest copies of the Hebrew Bible, which we call the Old Testament. Uh, they are the, uh, they contain the Jewish apocryphal books, some of them, and sectarian writings. This is writings written by the scroll community itself. And then it's com they're composed in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And so they fit right in at Schaefer Seminary. And they were produced between around 250 B.C. for the very earliest date. And then A.D. 60, just on the cusp of the destruction of the community by the Romans in A.D. 68. And the people from Qumran uh, probably, from what we can tell, fled uh, town south to Masada, uh, ending their uh, earthly uh, journey uh, around A.D. 73 with the Roman invasion of that site. But they were hidden in Judean desert caves uh, somewhere before the destruction of the community, and that gave us the opportunity some 2,000 years later to recover these lost documents. Now, where were these things found? Where they were discovered? Uh, obviously in Israel, uh, in, on the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea. Uh, there was a plateau, a community existed there, maybe from back as far as the time of Joshua with the city of Salt. Maybe it was also the place during the Iron Age of the School of the Prophets. These were all been suggested ideas. Uh, but certainly somewhere in the period we call the Hasmonean period, the late Hellenistic period, uh, there was a group of Jews who settled here with an ambition to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. This was what they were all about. Uh, they were really not only a messianic in their intent, but they were very much uh, messianic in their purpose. Uh, so to exist in order to prepare themselves to be a vanguard for the messianic age. So they're only about 19 miles to the south of Jerusalem, so quite close. Um, many believe this was a priestly community. Uh, this was an old view. I think it's sustained by some of the work I've done, which hasn't been published yet. But uh, they, we, we know that there was scribal activity there. That's been challenged, of course, but uh, I think the evidence of the scroll caves being at the community, trails between the community and the far caves where the uh, scrolls were found, those 11 caves, as well as the ones at the site itself, uh, clues within the scrolls that give 
their practice and what they did and things discovered on site that are part of the material culture of that community indicate this was the same group. And I have other reasons too, but uh, one of the things this group did, uh, it was kind of a yeshiva or a seminary. So it was like a Chafer seminary at the Dead Sea. And uh, there were families that lived outside of it, but within they had a study center and they maintained uh, a regular study uh, time there. One of the things they did is they brought scrolls in and studied them, uh, the scrolls would wear out. And so as we talked about already, the most efficient thing you could do was copy the scroll so you'd have a better copy of that scroll and then take the older version of that scroll to protect it because it was had its own sanctity. And then it would be put within a jar. Uh, now why would they have jars like this? Well, I think they took their clue from Jeremiah because before the exile, er, Jeremiah had been told in a typical way by God to buy some land, get a deed of purchase, and then put it in an earthenware jar and seal it up that it may last for a long time. So that when you come back from the exile, you'll say, this land is ours, here's the evidence for it. But this was a practice that was pretty common in that day, and we see it reflected here, and so they follow that practice. But those jars were then hidden in caves. You find those all along the uh, western side of the Dead Sea. There's some, of course, on the eastern side too, but they lived on the western side, and that's where most of the hiding was done. Probably not more than a, a mile on either side of the Qumran community because we know the caves at the north, and then I've been excavating caves in the south, and we know pretty much the limits of where the scrolls were hidden. Well, they remained hidden, and the, the, as I say, this group disappeared. They're not mentioned in the New Testament, except maybe by reputation, but there's no names. They're not mentioned in Jewish history. The Pharisees, the Sadducees who coexisted with them left no records of their own. So we have, we have nothing until the discovery was made of this cave. Uh, it's about a, a mile or so from the Qumran community. Uh, it's a very nondescript cave. You would never even think of it as a cave, more of just a craggy bluff. And a Bedouin a shepherd, as the story goes, and this is the actual guy. I've, one of the things I did was locate him. Uh, he's in his late 90s now. I'm not, I haven't heard that he's died yet. He lives in Bethlehem. But he, I took him back, and he reenacted all this on film for us. And so he threw the stone, according to the story, uh, lost one of the goats and didn't want to get scolded for losing a goat, so went looking for it and was throwing rocks to see if the goat was gone somewhere. Now, you can see the hole in front, that wasn't there. The archaeologists made that hole. Up above it was a very small hole, enough for a skinny man to get into, and maybe a flying goat to go into. I'm not going to say a goat couldn't do it. Uh, I have a daughter who raises goats, and uh, they do all kind of phenomenal things, but I don't think so. I mean, my th my st I think this is a cover story for just guys out treasure hunting, but anyway. But he said the stone was thrown in, and then uh, he heard not a goat, but the breaking of pottery, so went inside the cave, and he's pointing, and he said there were 37 jars all lined up in here, and they went through them, and they didn't find anything but this old paper stuff, and they took some, they, they threw some of it out the door, some of it they took back to camp and hung it in bags for a couple of years, at least, until someone said, well, you know, it has some writing on it, and you might take that up to Jerusalem to see if you can sell it to someone, and that's exactly what happened, and that's how we got, became known. It was an antiquities dealer that bought it. Uh, he was part of the Syrian Orthodox Church in Jerusalem, uh, St. Mark's, and he was, he didn't know what he was looking at either, but the Archbishop of the church did and wanted to buy them. He bought four of the scrolls. Three were bought by a Hebrew University professor who also knew what they had. And those were the seven scrolls that became revealed to the world in, let's say, the early 1950s. And that led to people going all over the place looking for more. Well, that's another part of the story. The Qumran community, where these things were produced, existed on this plateau overlooking the Dead Sea and with the, the mountains behind it. Uh, that's been excavated, uh, the different excavators in the 1950s, 1951 to 57, Roland DeVoe, who was a member of the Kolbe Bleak, he was uh, a Dominican priest, 
Uh, this was under Jordanian administration at the time, so he went and did the excavations at, that you see before you, below his name. And then uh, in the early, uh, say the end of 1960, 1990s through early 2000, uh, Yitzhak McGinn, who was over this area for the military, excavated with Yuval Peleg, a section uh, all in this area as well. And then I followed them uh, from 2002, 2012, excavating all the rest of that plateau. And some of my excavations from one season are right in front of you below my name. Uh, some of the things we found, many things, we found the first uh, wine jar. This was a jar still sealed. Uh, it was intact. It had wine in it, but it was uh, wine that was over 2,200 years old, uh, the first of its kind like that. Of course, it was dried up, but they tested it. It was fermented grape wine, uh, not date wine. It was very interesting, and that fits some theories we have about uh, something called a communal meal or a Messianic banquet that ties in with this because this was found in the context of things related to a sacred meal. Uh, Beverly, my wife, has worked with us in all these things as well. I put the drinking cup there because it goes very well with the, the wine. It's the type of lid that was on the jar we found as well. Uh, one of the things that found all over this plateau that no one thought anything was on the plateau, and yet it was really uh, all underground, <coughs> were these animal bone deposits. And tomorrow, when I talk about uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and how we can actually use them in our own studies, I'm going to focus primarily on the eschatological side of that and bring in the details about this. But right now you can see me clean one of these. Uh, they took all the remains of a meal that they had. Uh, they took all of the remains of that meal that were not eaten, including the ashes, and they buried them. But not only buried those, they buried all of the pots that they used to prepare the meal, to serve the meal, everything else. Everything was put together and buried. It's a very unusual practice. It's not anywhere else in the land of Israel that we know of, and so there's something very unique about it. And uh, here you see Beverly working on some of that as well. Uh, after I finished the 10 years of excavation here, I went to some of the caves. Uh, again, people said, all the scrolls have been found, there's nothing left, uh, you're wasting your time. And I said, well, uh, my time to waste, isn't it? So uh, we did that and uh, found this cave. Uh, we found about seven scroll jars in there. Now, they had no scrolls in them, but we found the jars, and you can see me down in one of the tunnels cleaning these things where they hid them. Uh, we found a scroll in one of the jars. Still has not been used multispectral imaging to try to get uh, writing on it. I think there's something there. Some people aren't convinced, still debate on it, but we did find this. Uh, this was all written up in a cover story in National Geographic in December of 2018 uh, called The Bible Hunters. And my, my claim to fame is not that I got in National Geographic, but at the very end of the column it says, and the Bible that Price reads and believes says above all to have faith. <laughs> and to get that National Geographic, it was worth it, okay? So that was something. Now, uh, we moved on to other caves after this one. You can see some of the kind of work inside the cave. I uh, found some very interesting things, this, this uh, bronze a cooking pot, the only one of its kind like this found. There were smaller ones found in the community, just one, but this is the first of its size and nature and kind. So there's a lot of first in things we've done. But that's uh, just to introduce you to the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you want to know more, I've written a book on the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think Robbie mentioned it earlier. There's also a film on the secrets of the Dead Sea Scroll. Uh, there's a PowerPoint available, both in a basic and advanced, uh, through Rose Publishing. Uh, there's also a pamphlet on the Dead Sea Scrolls I've done, and there's other things, too. Uh, there's some other books, the Stone's Kraut, which we have here at our book table, which has a section on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then a book I was going to mention yesterday, didn't have time, called Searching for the Original Bible. All the material I presented uh, in the last lecture, as well as some of the material that's already been covered by others uh, concerning the manuscripts, both Old and New Testament textual criticism, are in this book, Search of the Original Bible. Now, both these, the book uh, is out of print, so you have to go to Amazon.com to find something like this. Uh, I've also put things on our excavations at the Dead Sea in the Handbook of Biblical Archaeology, which I and Wayne House uh, wrote. Wayne's here as well, so uh, be sure and thank him for that book. And uh, 
So that's the kind of thing you can get more information from. Uh, also, a ministry that I have called World of the Bible Ministries, founded this about 30 years ago, to bring the world of the Bible to the word of the church, because all of our content has a context, and you have to get those things together uh, to get the message right. If you don't understand it in the time in which it was given, you can't properly export it to the 21st century and apply it. So this was the whole idea behind it. So we, pay, we take people to the world of the Bible through tours. We take the world of the Bible to people through publications. All right, our topic uh, deals with the value of the Dead Sea Scrolls for biblical studies. And the first is a witness to the accuracy of textual transmission, because we're very much concerned about how the Bible came to us, how the text we have. And is the text that we have now what they had then? Big question, okay? Have people meddled with it, done so much that it's totally transformed, and you have no idea that what you're reading is what were given by the original writers. Uh, before we had the Dead Sea Scrolls, we had some uh, older uh, witnesses to the text, and the Nash Papyri uh, dealt with parts of the Decalogue, and that was from the second century to first century uh, BC. Uh, and then the Samaritan Pentateuch, even though we have this older medieval uh, a, a version, it reflects an earlier text, and so that was very valuable to us. And then we had uh, copies of the Septuagint from the Minor Prophets, uh, some of these found that give that, and this one particularly from Nahal Hever, which is about 25 miles south of Qumran, uh, has the name of God in it. And notice it's in the Tetragrammaton, but it's in the Paleo-Hebrew, which means the, the Jews that were writing this still regarded that sacred name. You find the same type of practice done within the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves, particularly the Psalm Scrolls, all right? And there's a whole Paleo-Leviticus as well that's written in this more ancient script, even though that was not the script in, uh, in use at the time. Uh, and then we had uh, witnesses from the Masoretic texts, uh, the oldest we know of, extant and complete, is this Codex Sassoon. Um, Doug mentioned it earlier, this is up for auction right now. They expect it to, t to go for $50 million. If anybody wants to, uh, to go, I th think the, they, they're having the auction right now, but it's, um, it's the only complete copy like that. Uh, Aleppo Codex was the one most referred to, and the next oldest and nearly complete Hebrew Bible. So these all reflected where the text stood at its time. But still, uh, and the Leningrad Codex, we'll mention that one too, uh, for the Ben Asher Masoretic tradition. Uh, so the vowels, and not just vowels, okay, also accentuation things for, uh, they are, I take all of those, both the vowels as well as the accentuation things as their own commentary. Okay? So you don't take that as inspired, that's simply their view. And sometimes they put certain, um, shall we say, syntactical marks and things like ethnox and things like this and passage like Daniel 9 to, to say we don't read this as a messianic passage, uh, stop it here. But that's simply their uh, way of thinking. So uh, the textual synonyms of the Dead Sea Scrolls is that they preserve the Hebrew Bible um, as it existed at the latter part of the Second Temple period, as well as the time of Jesus. And we talk about what Bible did Jesus know? This is as close to it as we get, because it, this pre-existed Jesus' time. It was certainly one of the some of the texts, because we have varying text of the Hebrew text at Qumran. But what's sensational about them is their age. They're two thousand plus years old, uh, and older by at least a thousand years and more than the oldest copy of the Bible we had before they were discovered. So this is an amazing thing. And, uh, and so by comparison, let's just say, if we take something like the, the, lar the maybe say not the largest, but the, the most complete of a biblical book, that would be the great Isaiah scroll. Uh, there's multiple copies of Isaiah, and I'll show you that in a moment, but this one dated at least to the, the way it is written. Okay, this is uh, carbon 14 date, 125 BC. 
But this was a study copy. You can already see just from the picture up here how you have marginal notes and additions and things. So it went through a number of revisions. So we can push this back at least to 200 BC in terms of uh, the text itself. And what's interesting is here you have the Aleppo Codex from around, let's say, 1000 AD. And then you have the Isaiah Scroll from uh, here, you know, let's say 200 BC. And the gap between them, it, it closes this gap of, of complete darkness. We had, we had no text, no witnesses. And all of a sudden, we have an abundance of witnesses. And that's why it was one of the greatest archaeological textual discoveries of all time. So this takes us back closer to the autographer of the Old Testament as it left uh, the hands of, of Ezra. And so when you look at these, comparing them word by word, line by line, uh, with the version from which our English Old Testaments are translated, you have about a 95% agreement, which is remarkable. Okay, now I'll show you in a moment, there's about 200 variants in this great Isaiah scroll. But in terms of the real significance, there, there's not any great difference at all, which tells us that the scribes did a remarkable job. Now, we haven't gone through anything like that yet, uh, talking to you about the scribal uh, tradition and how these people were trained from birth and they were part of a scribal caste. This was their, their job, this is all they knew, how they memorized the text, how they had all these rules of the scribe, how they washed and dressed and came to work to do just this work. Uh, if you were writing a uh, copy in a scroll and a king entered the room and called you by name and you happened to be writing the name of God at the moment, you were not allowed to raise your head and even acknowledge his presence until you finished writing the name of God. Uh, and so I was thinking about the text we looked at where it talks about the king is required to write for himself a copy of uh, this law. But it says in the presence of the Levitical priest which means they're watching everything he writes. So the chance of error is reduced because they know the text and they know if he misses something and they can correct him on the spot. These scribes, it was amazing the work and now we have evidence of that. With, with, two, with, with a thousand years and more of transmission of the text, it, there's no variance but by 5%. So that's an incredible thing. It tells us that we can trust the text and that these people took their work very seriously. Uh, now, you look at the, <coughs> this brings us, us to the textual evidence. We had the original Hebrew text, the autographa, uh, before 400 BC. Samaritan Pentateuch is a witness in between, we could say, but then the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, gives us a text uh, close to the Masoretic text. We call it a proto-Masoretic text. And then we have the other witnesses that are there. And then we have the oldest Hebrew manuscript from which our Bibles are translated. So these are all the witnesses that are there, but before 1947, there's this 1,200 year gap that existed between the text, and that's all closed with the Dead Sea Scrolls, the biblical text. And by the way, the sectarian text is a whole nother huge section of these scrolls, and they cite from the Hebrew Bible as well. So we have all of that, not just the, the Hebrew Bible text themselves. Now, while a portion of every, Hebrew, of every text in the Hebrew Bible exists, except for the book of Esther, it should be noted that the remains of only one manuscript each were found of Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah, only two manuscripts for Joshua and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Uh, I mentioned how Esther was used at Purim. Most people have their own copies, and that's probably why we don't find it. But we do have allusions uh, to Esther. There's a proto-Esther text. So there's no doubt that that was there, or it just hasn't been discovered yet. My wife's great ambition is to find the Esther scroll someday, digging in a cave. I don't know if we will, but, <clears throat> but, it's, uh, but scholars see in the number of surviving biblical texts a relative indicator of the books of Scripture that were important to this Jewish community. So I'll look at this for a moment. Here is a list of <clears throat> the biblical manuscripts, and I've highlighted those that are most in number. So Genesis uh, is at the top of the list in one sense uh, because it was extremely important to them. Because as you know, and I know, that this is the foundation for every major doctrine in the rest of Scripture. If you don't have Genesis right, 
And of course, this is the beginning of Israel's history, beginning with chapter 12. If you don't have this right, you have nothing right. So this is why it has always been a perennial battleground. Uh, when you come to Exodus and Leviticus, you'd expect those books which guided the community to be large. Deuteronomy is the largest of all. 34 copies of Deuteronomy were found. Now, this was also Jesus' favorite book. You say, really? Yeah. He cites more from Deuteronomy than from anything else. And as you get familiar with Deuteronomy and Moses' sermon on the plains at Moab, you begin to realize why. Uh, you know, the whole plan of God is laid out all the way through the tribulation period. <laughs> that's, it's amazing stuff that's there. So it's a very important book. But Isaiah, 23 copies of it, and then 10 of Daniel, and we can add two more to that that have been discovered since this list was made. So you can see they had a very strong uh, interest in prophetic books and, and certainly in the core foundational books that uh, comprise Israel's history. Uh, when we look at it kind of in a pie chart, you can see that breaking it up, about 200 plus manuscripts represent the biblical books, about 200 the sectarian text, and, these are, and a lot of these are commentaries on the Bible itself. So it's very interesting. I mean, you find a 2,000-year-old commentary on, on the Bible. And then other parts of Jewish literature, because this was there. And by the way, they distinguished, in my opinion, between apocryphal books and biblical books. Uh, the name of God, which we talk about, is there, uh, is never put in the Paleo-Hebrew in any of these books. Uh, and there's other distinguishing factors that seem to say these, are, these were accepted as Jewish literature, but not on par with Scripture. That's why I think there is a canon already at Qumran. Now, comparing these things in terms of their age and their content, you can just look at the Dead Sea Scrolls having a, almost a complete canon of Scripture for us as compared to all these older codexes that we had that only had parts of either the prophets or some of, some of, the, uh, of the Torah. I think this is far stands above it all. That's a remarkable thing. So uh, that in itself, that, the, that we can witness to the transmission of the text and say it has accuracy. So you can tell people you can trust your Bible simply on the basis of the witness of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay? That in itself tells us we have a very stable and preserved text. Now another thing we have as a benefit is the interpretive method of the Dead Sea commentators. Uh, we call one of these methods Pesher interpretation, in which you, it's, here's how it works. You quote the biblical text, you give an interpretation of that text, and then the commentary argues that the fulfillment has reference to something contemporary, contemporary events. Uh, this is a lot of our prophecy books in our, our group anyway. We do the same thing, okay? Uh, Gog and Magog. It's, you know, here's in Ezekiel 38 39, but here it is in the news. And in my commentary says it's going to happen real soon. We do the same type of thing. Uh, and we have examples of this. One I have here, the book of Habakkuk. Uh, so here's how that would work out. Uh, here's Pesher Habakkuk. And so this is a, a literal interpretation, but with application. So let's put it that way. So they write in this, God told Habakkuk to write down that which would happen to the final generation. But he did not make known to him when that time would come to an end. So the interpreter is saying that Habakkuk was written prophetically for a generation that would live in the end time. And obviously, as you look at Habakkuk, you know, just stand on your you know, place and watch and see how he will answer and, and, and don't know when that answer is going to come. So it looks like it's projected for the far future. And then... Uh, it tells us they cite, in this case, Psalms 37.10, A little while, and the wicked shall be no more. I will look toward his place, but he shall not be there. Well, when is that? Well, that's got to be in the end time. So they say at the end, their interpretation is the end of 40 years, a generation which they believe their community would see. The wicked will perish, and not an evil man shall be left on the earth. So this applies to an eschatological end time battle in which all the wicked are put down. In order to have the Lord reign in righteousness, you have to put down unrighteousness. So there's a peace on the other side of war, and that's what they're talking about. Um, we can see the Dead Sea Scrolls have significance, just not only for the transmission of the text, uh, but also 
they demonstrate textual similarities to and differences from what became the traditional text of the Hebrew scriptures more than a thousand years later. So as we look at this, another pie chart here, what we see is we have variants in the Old Testament, or Hebrew Bible. There'll be differences in spelling, harmonizations, grammatical issues, word order. Uh, some of this affects meaning, but usually it does not affect doctrine. Okay, so there's just some differences there. So we're going to get into some of that, a little bit of it. But let's first talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls and Bible translation. Uh, if you have, you know, you're stuck with the Schofield Reference Bible from 1901 or whatever it was, you know, and uh, didn't even get the revised Schofield, whatever, none of that, they, they didn't take into consideration the witness of the Dead Sea Scrolls in any of their translations. But since 1950, uh, every major Bible translation has claimed to have taken into account the textual evidence of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That means it's extremely important, and whether you know it or not, those Bibles, the ESV, the NIV, the um, NASV, all of these uh, use the Dead Sea Scrolls in their, as they made their committee decisions and translations. Now, the value of the Dead Sea Scrolls also helps us aid in refuting higher critical claims. We've talked about low criticism being simply the variations in the text. High criticism deals with, well, what we believe that text says and how we critique those things. So some of these that are uh, very well known, uh, the date for the close of the canon, I mentioned that yesterday, but here you see on the road of Emmaus that our Lord spoke to those he was walking with and said, uh, these are the words I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things which are written about me, and notice that already tells you that in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, there are things written about the Messiah. Okay? If you don't believe that, then you don't believe Jesus. Just flat out. He says, it's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, and it must be fulfilled. So it's, it's written there so that we'll have a future time of fulfillment, some of which has been fulfilled in the past with the first coming of Messiah, so be fulfilled with the second coming of Messiah. When we come to the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have uh, different texts that say there's a, con there's a canon, there's some recognized order. He says, we have written to you that you must understand the book of Moses, that would be the Torah, the prophets, that's Nevi'im, the prophets, and of David, he represents then the Ketuvim, the writings, which include the Psalms, for instance. So this is what's there. Uh, as I said, critical scholars date the recognition of the canon to 1890 at the Council of Jamnia. Um, well, conservative scholars would date it at 425 with Ezra, somewhere in there. Uh, and that they assume a close of the canon there. This argues for the conservative date because now we have something at least 100 B.C. in some of this text here saying already this is recognized this way. So it argues for an earlier date rather than a later date and, and conforms with the gospel account, which is somewhat in the same time period. Now, the unity of the book of Isaiah. Uh, I, it's hard to find a seminary nowadays that believes in the unity of the book of Isaiah, my, the one, my own included, okay? Old Testament professors just don't accept that anymore. There's a first and second Isaiah, even a third Isaiah, Tredo Isaiah, if you want. So this was the belief that uh, the Isaiah scroll, uh, as it came down, uh, was recognized based, based a lot on the idea of predictive prophecy, which they denied. Uh, you couldn't have prediction of the Babylonian captivity and a book written that also talks about the Assyrian period, so that's not possible. So they just said, you look at the style of Isaiah. It very, very much looks at the style and vocabulary and things that you have an earlier uh, first Isaiah, then a second, and maybe even a third as you move into chapters 40 through 66. Uh, others said, you know, you know, I mean, look at papers you wrote when you were in grade school. Look at papers you wrote when you were in college. Look at papers you're writing now as you're in seminary or, or after seminary. Could you compare those and think they came from the same person? No, your vocabulary has changed because you've developed a greater vocabulary. 
and your style has changed too because now you have more stylistic uh, uh, shall we say maturity to you and and your age affects that too and the way you communicate so this is written over a long span of isaiah's ministry that accounts for much but let's just say that was the case when you come to a scroll like this in which we see there are scribal awareness of compositional text breaks and other types of issues they're very sensitive to that so the idea is between chapter 39 and chapter 40, you have 1st Isaiah and then 2nd Isaiah. But when you come to this text, what you find is that uh, the text just continues and then jumps up on the next line. Here's chapter 39 going round and up then into 40. They see no compositional break. They, they see no 2nd uh, Isaiah. And of course, when we come to Jesus and others who cite from Isaiah, they cite from both sections of Isaiah equally, and they're all attributed to the prophet Isaiah. But And this, this argues for a conservative dating of this. There's more details to this, but it, it would be strange if these chapters written by different Isaiahs and not somehow indicated in a text in which there are other indications that they knew those kind of differences existed. And then we have the date of the book of Daniel. This is still... Uh, a battleground for conservatives. Um, another thing that a lot of the seminaries have abandoned, or conservative evangelical seminaries have abandoned uh, an early date for Daniel. Uh, I'm not sure her, how you remain evangelical or remain an inerrantist if you say Daniel didn't write Daniel. The events it describes were not prophetic, you know, when it clearly says they are prophetic. I mean, how, how do you deal with that? But anyway. Uh, you can see here I've listed some of the fragments for the book of Daniel uh, found in cave one and four and six. Um, there's now one, I think, another one from cave four that's been identified. Uh, and so these can be dated paleo paleographically by the style and also carbon 14 dated. The earliest we have is 125 BC, others 100 BC. But that uh, already presents a bit of a problem. The problem for the critics is they date Daniel to the mid-2nd century B.C., um, which is exactly the same time these scrolls were written, all right, or date, date. Uh, and so uh, they say, well, the genre is apocalyptic. Well, who says? It's prophetic. There's a difference between prophecy and apocalyptic. But they, they want to put it in that category. And as they do, then they say Daniel wrote only when this style of apocalyptic literature was in vogue. And that would be this time of the Second Temple period. It predicts things like the Maccabean Revolt, or, or, or Antiochus IV Epiphanes, or things like this. And not by name, but the events described have to be written after they occurred. How else could it be? This is called post-eventu prophecy. Had to be that way. Well, no, it didn't. Not if you believe in a, in a God who can do all things and reveal his secrets to his prophets. No, you could do that. Now here's the problem. If you have texts that date from the very period they're supposed to have first been composed, and then you look at these texts, and like here's one that has variants, textual variants. Now how do you get a textual variant? Not from writing it right then, only as it's passed on and it has to wear out and then be you know, trans, uh, transferred, transmitted. Uh, we have a variant here and here. One is in agreement with the Syriac Peshitta. The other substitutes Elohim for yud heh vav -Hey, uh, he who is, if you take Doug's understanding. It takes time for a variant to enter in. It takes time through successive copying for this to happen. Uh, I mean, transmission of a text, and it's not just in one place. Here's, look at all these different changes and marginal notes and things in a text of Daniel. So if you have this kind of thing, you realize that it's been around a while, and they have multiple, multiple copies. It's a very important book for them, and they cite from it in a lot of their other commentaries. For it to gain canonical status like this takes time, especially an oddball book like Daniel. But it apparently was received and popular and the basis for a lot of their interpretation. And it has these textual variants, and it's dated to a time far too early for it to already have been received and copied and transmitted to the community. So if, if you know, let's say they're already uh, having these texts uh, in their possession in the mid-2nd century B.C., 
and that's when they're supposed to have been written. If you push it back just even one month, might as well push it back to the 6th century BC because you've already defeated their argument. There's a lot of uh, arguments for this. I'll just say something that Vanderkam and Flint, Peter Flint, by the way, uh, he would be with the Lord a number of years ago. He was uh, a Baptist. He was an evangelical. He was really fit in well with our camp, and uh, he was one of the major contributors to this, and he also was behind the translating publication of the Great Isaiah Scroll, uh, with the, the Brill Commentary. So uh, they write, a total of eight Daniel scro scrolls were discovered at Qumran, two in Cave 1, five in Cave 4, one in Cave 6. None is complete due to the ravages of time, but between them they preserve texts from 11 of Daniel's 12 chapters. This does not mean the book lacked the final chapter at Qumran, since Daniel 12.10 is quoted in the, in the Philogrium, which tells us that it is written in the book of Daniel the prophet. And by the way, at Qumran, they call him Daniel the prophet. Where else do we see that term used? By Jesus in the Olivet Discourse. Okay, you don't, the book of Daniel was relegated to the Ketuvim, not the prophets. And that happened, I think, in, this, in later, uh, probably the second century A.D., Rabbis did that because they were worried about people calculating the end of days. Uh, Rabbi Kiba most notably said, you know, let uh, someone be, you know, accursed who would dare to predict the end of days. And then he turned around and predicted the end of days and, and said Bar Kokhba uh, was the Messiah. Okay, so, but the idea was that if you moved it from the prophets to the wisdom literature, because it has some pedagogical stuff at the beginning of it, people would not look at it as prophecy and they would not try to predict the end of days because all of them did it from Daniel because of the calculations there. But, they, but here at Qumran, it's Daniel the prophet, just like it is on the lips of our Lord Jesus. And he says, uh, all eight manuscripts are copied in a space of 175 years, ranged from about 125 B.C., to about 50 CE. And what's important is that none of the apocryphal additions to Daniel, which we know were part of that late Second Temple period, okay, the, all, all uh, Bell and the Dragon, all these other types of things that were based on Daniel, none of those appear in the Qumran fragments. They didn't even know those existed. There's no witness to them. So if, if Daniel was like them, a pseudo-Daniel, and written then, why wouldn't it appear among the Dead Sea Scrolls? So you have a, a positive witness that you have of these manuscripts, and they're dated as old as they are, and then you have also a negative uh, testimony, the fact that you don't have other things that witness to Daniel because they were later in time and not considered to be canonical. Uh, so all these types of things were there. Uh, there are other examples. I think I'll uh, skirt some of this. I had more details on why Daniel could not have a Maccabean origin. Uh, but let me just say, I think I've said enough to let you know the scrolls have uh, pushed back critics. They, they have to answer this. And they try to simply say that with a short period of time, you could have had uh, it composed, accepted, and transmitted, but that we know of nothing else in all of history that has that short of a compositional period and acceptance period and transmission period. Just doesn't work, okay? And again, the reasons against Daniel have to do with the fact that it has predictive prophecy. Now, another thing is this aids to resolving Old Testament textual issues. And I want to show you some of these. Let's look at some that uh, you may not even know was an issue, but here in Psalms 22:16, uh, we have in our English Old Testament, we read, For dogs surround me, a gang of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. And so uh, this is drawn largely from the Septuagint, but we have um, the Christian testimony that Psalms 22 is a Messianic psalm, and it predicts from beginning to end the experiences of our Lord as he was on the cross. How do we know that? When you come to the account in the Gospels, he starts with the idea, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, which is the first words of this psalm, and then ends with, it is finished, which is also the last words of this psalm. So he has this in mind, and he leaves us a witness from the cross of how David was a type of him, uh, and that's very obvious throughout the Old Testament too. So the text has given us that, but 
Judaism pushed back on this, and one reason is because while the Septuagint was the Bible of the church, both the Old Testament Septuagint and then the New Testament Koine Greek, which we know, uh, it had the term horutzan, which means pierced. So it was clear. But uh, that's not what the Masoretic text says. The Masoretic text uh, is quite different. Let me get to that real quick. Masoretic text, uh, which I have at the bottom down here, it says, dogs have surrounded me, uh, the wicked have uh, surrounded me, uh, ka'ari, like a lion, are my hands and my feet. Yadi yadri, okay? So uh, you have the term as a lion, ka'ari. Well, that's a long way from the idea of pierced. Uh, but if you realize now, we found the Septuagint had to get that reading from someplace because it's copying a Hebrew text. Uh, so where did it get it? Well, now we have that. Now, however, just a distance from Qumran, they found this text, and you can see it. It's right here. Uh, the black and white makes it a little clearer than maybe the color one. Oh, it's the color one's pretty good. Ka'ari. You don't have any spaces between the, the letters. But it doesn't say Ka'ari. It says Ka'aru. Kaf, Aleph, Resh, Vav. Okay? Ka'aru. Now, that's a wholly different thing. Um, and so when you look at these in comparison, you can see, and you can see I'm having them circled with red, ka'ari, ka, that is your preposition, as, and ari, a lion. But then when you have ka'aru, this is the verbal form, okay? And it means pierced. So it's, you know, they pierced, third person, a plural here. So, we have a Hebrew text that says that. We don't have a Hebrew text, as far as I know, that says ka'ari. We have just simply the witness of the Masoretic text, no older text. So what that does for us, it says we have at least an understanding where the Septuagint got it, and you can't argue against this reading. It's actually the oldest uh, Hebrew reading that we have. And you can see how a scribe could make a mistake. If you have a worn out document, you see the difference between the, the little yud at the end of ka'ari and the vav at the end of ka'aru? Just a tiny little part of a pen stroke. So if the text is worn in the least bit, you would, you would read that noun, trying to make sense of it rather than the verb. Now this could also be intentional because you've at this point had uh, a long period of dispute over this text between Jews and Christians. Uh, this is some of the evidence that Christians brought up. Uh, and they had these debates before kings and other figures. So it might be that you would want to alter it just a little bit to protect the Jewish community from misunderstanding. But we don't know which, how to, uh, to explain it. But we can at least see what happened. All right, so that's what we have. Ka'ari and Ka'aru noun versus verb. Now we have in, in the Isaiah scroll, as I mentioned, some 200 variants in comparison to the Masoretic text. Uh, those are very significant in many cases. Uh, they affect orthography, a difference in consonants, different grammatical forms, different words, omissions of words, additions of words. Uh, as I say, most of these don't affect interpretation, but they're there and they have to be explained. So here's some examples of differences. Uh, Isaiah uh, 6.3, uh, the MT uh, has holy, 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 but the Qumran text just says holy, holy. Okay. Uh, in Isaiah 12.4, the Masoretic text says, plural they, you, you will say, plural, I mean, there's no you plural uh, in English, as you know. We say y'all, look down here in Texas, that's good, you know, but we don't have that in uh, but in other languages, it's a clear grammatical distinction. But here it's used singular in uh, the Qumran text. In uh, Isaiah 37, 25, there's something about waters, and there's something about strange waters. In Qumran text, building off a passage in Kings. And then Isaiah 53, 11, the most significant one I want to show you, uh, where it, and this is the famous passage of the Messiah's suffering. Uh, it says, he, he shall see, and then it just goes on. But in the Qumran text, it says, he shall see light. And this is after the passage of his suffering and death, and all of a sudden he shall see, and it talks about his posterity. But uh, it doesn't necessarily imply he came back to life. Well, he must have in order to have a posterity, and, uh, 
But the Qumran text uh, uh, speaks very clearly about this in terms of uh, seeing light, the light of life. Now, uh, the Masoretic text talks about he has broken the covenant, he has despised the cities, he regards no man, and has cities, uh, Arim, instead of what Qumran Isaiah says, it says Atim, witnesses. The enemy has broken the covenant, he's despised witnesses, he has regard for no one. Now, in terms of the context and the explanation, witnesses fits a whole lot better. Okay, it, it uh, is the reason a lot of English translations, the RSV, NIV, NET, have all adopted this textual variant. But these are the kind of things that you will see going on. Uh, here's the word about the suffering servant. As we see it in the Masoretic text, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many who will bear their iniquities. Uh, but when we come to the text in Isaiah 53, 11 of the great Isaiah scroll, it s adds the term light, or. And by the way, this was already in the Septuagint. Septuagint said phos, light. So it's not that we didn't have a witness to this, but we didn't have a Hebrew witness to it, and now we do. Uh, he shall see the travail of his soul, meaning he shall see the results of the fruits of the travail of his soul. But the variant light more readily suggests the idea of resurrection. And that may be one reason why it was suppressed, if you want to put it that way. So here it is in the text. You can see, uh, you know, vayahi or, uh, he, he will see light uh, and be satisfied. Uh, there it is. Now, how do you decide on this variant? Okay, just to think about this, you can see that uh, different versions uh, either saw it or added it, uh, but um, when you come to Theodosian and Aquila, which are older witnesses that uh, obviously we have, uh, like Semachus as well, all of them simply follow the MT at this point. Uh, but here again, we have in both of the versions, we have of the Isaiah scroll from Qumran, he will see light is there. So we have the Qumran text, and they agree with the Septuagint in this case. Uh, so that's interesting. We have that. Uh, then you have homolatuotan, which is the idea of something be omitted because something looks like something else. So if you look at the text, you can see or looks like ah, uh, and could be that a scribal uh, omission was there because he just thought he saw it and omitted it. Uh, these are all possibilities for it. But uh, you'll see that a lot of people have adopted the fact that it should say he will see light. Uh, when we look at this, this is a prime example of the Proto-Masoretic group uh, and how it differs from the Septuagint here, but at the same time, Vaihi Or, um, again, suffered because of graphic similarity, hafoglyphy, the idea of repeating something. But if we accept Vaihi Or, he will see light as original, uh, it explains why the lack of Or exists. Again, uh, the, the harder reading would, would have light in there. The easier reading is to not have it, and there it is. So due to visual similarity, a scribe would have written uh, uh, Yere, okay, and thinking he's saying, you know, uh, fear instead of order, light, and looked at the wrong place and written it by accident. So we have some good justification for accepting that, which adds to the messianic uh, character of Isaiah's message. And then uh, we have uh, the, uh, this is essential to Old Testament textual criticism. We just did a little bit of it, but here is an interesting passage in 1 Samuel 11. Uh, in 1 Samuel 11 in the Masoretic text, it says, Nahash the Ammonite came up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh Gilead said to Nahash, make a covenant with us and we will serve you. But Nahash the Ammonite said to them, I will make it with you on this condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you Thus, I'll make it a reproach on Israel. Well, the question is, of course, why did he require the right eye be gouged out? 
the Septuagint and Josephus give additional information about this requirement. So if you look, uh, for instance, here, uh, you'll see the addition of a paragraph that explains the purpose for the mutilation. And here is 1Q Samuel, this is the, the Dead Sea text. Nahash, king of the children of Ammon, solely oppressed the children of Gad and the children of Reuben, and he gouged out all of their right eyes and struck terror and dread in Israel. There was no one left among the children of Israel beyond the Jordan whose right eye was not gouged out by Nahash, king of the children of Ammon, except for 7,000 men who had fled from the children of Ammon and entered Jabesh Gilead. So now, it says, and about a month later. So the idea is that we did it on this side, we're going to do it on this side. Okay, so, you know, quid pro quo or something like that, you know, we're, we're just going to follow the same practice. We didn't have that information. Uh, Josephus had it from someplace. He gives the same account in Jewish antiquities and talks about, for he put out the right eyes of those who delivered themselves. And so he understands. So he gets this information from some Hebrew text, as does the Septuagint. But why is it in the Masoretic text is the question. So... Uh, it could have been omitted by a careless scribe uh, who confused the last words of 1 Samuel 10.27, he, but he kept silent with the opening words of 1 Samuel 11.1. 1. Now, that's not in the Masoretic text, but it is in the Septuagint, which assumes a Hebrew text would have something like Kahodish, you know, about a month later. You look at that, and there's so much similarity between the terms. As you're writing, you could have, uh, have omitted, jumped a whole paragraph in this case and done that. Now, is that likely or not? Well, somebody did it. We, you know, why they did it is still the question, but uh, it, first, there, there's two explanations. One is this one. The scribe skipped to the end of the first phrase, to the end of the second, uh, and omitted the whole paragraph in between, or it may have resulted from a scribe copying a text that had an explanatory note added by another scribe for clarification, resulting in a longer version of this text. That's possible, you know, uh, such scribal accidents or omissions uh, could happen, but not intentionally, as this implies. Because if you look at the rules of the conduct of a scribe, you just don't have that much error. If you, if you accept that kind of thing here, why not then all the rest of Isaiah? Uh, and we see that that didn't exist. There's only 5% variance. So, uh, but we have this. We have this witness to a Hebrew text that gives us this information that both the Septuagint and Josephus said. Um, here's one too, Exodus 1.5, about how many people uh, came um, into the land of, of Israel, from, uh, came into Egypt from the land of Canaan. It says all the persons from Jacob were 75. And that's also mentioned in Acts 7.14. So it's very interesting. You, ha you have the terms 5 and 70 people or souls here mentioned in 4Q13. And again, over here in 4Q1 has that. Um, where did that come from? Because the Masoretic text doesn't read that way. Um, Masoretic text reads 70 persons. But again, the New Testament... Uh, and the Greek text of Acts is citing Exodus 1.5, its implication, and it says 75. So what we find here is we know now that there is a Hebrew text, you know, of Exodus that has that exact reading in it. So again, um, there, there are different explanations on this, but in this case here, the, the text agrees with the Septuagint, and it agrees with the New Testament citation from a Hebrew text, uh, and that explains the textual variant. Um, here's another interesting one, Deuteronomy 32:43, where it says, uh, worship him all you divine ones, or all you angels. Uh, that's not in the Masoretic text, and yet the author of Hebrews cites it. Uh, so the author of Hebrews says, when he comes, brings his firstborn to the world, it says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Well, that's not in the Masoretic text, so where'd they get it? Oh, but there is a Hebrew text that has that. Um, and so this, uh, the, the Greek, older Greek version found in Deuteronomy 32, 43, angels of God worship him, uh, comes from this. So we see that the, what did the Septuagint translate? What text did it have? It had a text like this. And that was a text also known 
to someone like Stephen as he's citing this, uh, or in this case, he, uh, the author of Hebrews citing this as well. Now let me just, I have a little bit of time because we started a little later. Uh, the value of the Dead Sea Scrolls for New Testament studies. And I'm, this has to be abbreviated, but let me just say that while no New Testament text were a part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Jewish group that settled at Qumran was not Christian, their community was informed by the same type of biblical text and Jewish religious writings known and studied by the Jewish community of the first century when Jesus lived. And the Christian church had its beginning. So it's a very pivotal time uh, for these scrolls to be produced and for commentaries and other things to be written. And as such, they have much to offer to the student of the New Testament. So here's Christor Stendhal, uh, not necessarily in our camp, but he is a conservative. Uh, he writes this, he said, it is true to say that the scrolls add to the background of Christianity, but they add so much that we arrive at a point where the significance of similarities definitely rescues Christianity from false claims of originality in the popular sense and leads us back to a new grasp of its true foundation and the person and events of its Messiah. Only in this sense is it true to say that the difference between the two sects is one of messianology or Christology, or that it is Jesus that makes the difference. The roots, the prophecies, the concepts were the same. But things, but different things happened, okay? So this is something you're going to see. I mean, before the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, New Testament scholars were pretty much saying that the Gospel of John was a Greek concept. You had this idea of predestination. You had these terms uh, about light and the logos and stuff. This is all, you know, all Greek influence. Uh, that's why it was set apart from the Synoptic Gospels. It was separate. Um, you really had people saying that the New Testament is the product of the Christian church some 100, 200 years or more after the time of Jesus, uh, and, and all of that was very Greek-influenced. All that changed with the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I'll explain why here. For one, the Dead Sea Scrolls are, for New Testament research, the only suitable comparative material. There are no documents that record similar material from the same time period. Even the rabbinic writings and the Palestinian Targums, they come from, you know, the first century B.C., but these are earlier, and the rabbinic writings are 200 to 600 A.D., and already you've had great theological changes within Judaism, so, you know, you're looking for a more pristine Judaism before there's these debates, before Jesus appears on the scene. What did they really believe? And both the Qumran scrolls and the New Testament were produced in the matrix of what is known as Palestinian Judaism. So says Geza Vermes. He says both were messianic and eschatological in orientation. They shared a sectarian separatist position among the Jewish movements with a unique allegiance to a central prophetic leader and produced their own sectarian literature while regarding the Old Testament and divine inspiration as the authoritarian source. For this reason, comparison between the two bodies of literature is not only reasonable, it's indispensable. All right? So, let's say uh, one significance is it provides a context for Christianity. I've already mentioned that. Here's an example. Um, the Essenes, the Pharisees, Sadducees, no writings left about them. This all comes from what we know from uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, temple rituals, social customs, religious views, political events, historical events, all mentioned in the sectorian writings uh, in one way or another. Legal interpretations, specialized vocabulary, geographic information, topographic information, things that you, could, you would not have anywhere, that you couldn't confirm from any source. Now we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, just the rule of the community, which deals uh, with this group called the Yahad, the, the, and even the term Yahad, which means unity. You know, you have Psalms, was it 133? Uh, uh, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity, or together, okay, Yahad, different from Echad, which is one, this is a different. And they call their community that, it means assembly. And it's drawn from the same idea of, uh, like, the church is a community, although probably the church, ecclesia, comes from kahal, which is the Hebrew term for assembly or congregation. But this is there. Uh, this document, which explains their practices and, and their own rules as a community, as a group, 
um, just like Andy was explaining earlier about, uh, you know, the, shall we say, what do you call it, the, the, the beliefs of Chafer Seminary, not what you call it, we, the distinctives, okay? They had their own distinctives, which they uh, made their members conform to, and they had a two-year uh, period before they could be initiated into it. And it talks about baptism, the Sabbath, and mess- Messianic beliefs and practices and all these things which we never knew existed and now we know. So these are very important things for us. And I'll just pick Jesus for a moment and Paul as we come uh, to look at this. Uh, parallels proposed between Jesus and the scrolls are things like the Beatitudes. They have a section that looks like the same type of form and structure of Jesus' Beatitudes, which are drawn a lot on the Proverbs and the style of that in the Old Testament. Uh, a negative temple perspective not negative that the temple is bad, and negative that the practices in the temple are bad, that you don't have a Zadokite priesthood over the temple. The temple was built by Herod, that the, that the temple is subject to abuse by the Romans, and uh, you have, they, had, they have a, uh, a solar calendar, not a lunar calendar, or vice versa. You know, they, all these things they were complaining about, so they didn't go to the temple. But they didn't say the temple itself was bad. That was something that was God's house. Uh, and Jesus didn't condemn the temple as such either. He condemned the practices in the temple. People surrounded with the temple. He said, my house should be a, my house should be a house of prayer for all nations. Okay, from Isaiah 56, uh, 7. Now, there's references to the sons of light. And Jesus refers to the sons of light. And he perhaps has an uh, oblique reference to these guys. Um, there's a strict view on divorce, by the way. I won't go into that. I, I have a whole bunch of slides on it, but the whole idea is that except for incest and their interpretation of Qumran, uh, divorce was not allowed. And this is the idea that it's not really a legal marriage if two people are related. Therefore, the divorce uh, is natural because there was no, uh, the law was broken in the first place to even have the marriage. And when you come to the exception clause in Matthew, uh, people debate this and say, what is pornea? What do we deal with this? Well, uh, the, the term they used, zenuth, which has to do with incest, some have tied to a, a more technical phrase of pornea. This was uh, um, Charles Ryrie's view, for instance, among others, at, at least at one time. Uh, and so I don't think Charles ever departed from that anyway, but it but that, this has its roots already back here in Qumran interpretation. Now, I'll give you some that are a little clearer. The, Jew, the Jewish trial of Jesus under the high priest Caiaphas. Uh, Jesus is condemned. He's condemned not to being stoned, which they have the legal right to do. Okay, Stephen, there's no problem with Stephen being stoned and Paul presiding over it. So the Jews had the right of execution, uh, particularly for blasphemy. But is Jesus being accused of blasphemy? And why don't they carry out that sentence of execution? Why do they have to take him to the Romans? Why on earth would they do that? It'd be so easy just to handle, handle business. So that's been a question. You know, why the Romans? The Jewish authorities had the legal right to execute anyone they found guilty of violating Jewish law. This was recognized by the Romans. So why then did the Jewish authorities contend that they were not permitted to put anyone to death? But that's the clue is found in the next verse here in John 18. It says that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke signifying what kind of death he was about to die. Okay, so the Jews had the authority to put to death, but only a certain kind of death. And the crime or the punishment had to fit the crime. So we, we wondered about this. It was unclear. Well, in Cave 11 here at Qumran, a scroll was found known as the Temple Scroll. The temple Scroll has a lot to say about an eschatological temple and all of that as well. But one thing it says here, it talks about the punishment for a person who is a seditionist. And here's the text. It says, if a man is a traitor against his people and gives them up to a foreign nation, so doing evil to his people, you are to hang him on a tree until dead. On the testimony of two or three witnesses, he shall be put to death, and they themselves shall hang him on a tree. And we know this this document even predates the Qumran community. So this is an ancient uh, understanding of our text in Deuteronomy. That's what's going on here. 
um, Deuteronomy 21, 22, which talks about execution by hanging on a tree. And when Paul in Galatians 3, 13 mentions, he says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So it's clear that there's something about the about crucifixion, which is hanging on a tree. All right, that's the, uh, the wood beam and the way he was executed uh, that was necessary, fulfills the prophecy, fulfills the statement. So you see this in the New Testament when in John eleven forty nine, 49, Caiaphas states that Jesus claims betrayed the Jewish nation by threatening to bring the Roman action against it. He said, if this man goes on like this, the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And what is he saying? Jesus, by claiming to be a Messiah, claims to be a revolutionary who is going to overthrow the existing established regime. He's going to be king. And there's only one king, and that's Caesar. So on that basis, they have a way to execute him, not just simply for blasphemy. So it was necessary for the Sanhedrin to turn Jesus over to the Roman authorities for that kind of judgment. And the Dead Sea Scrolls have made that clear to us, okay? So let me just, there's others we could move ahead on, but I'm getting the, the thumbs down. Um, there's a few interesting ones, Isaiah 61. Uh, by the way, when Jesus reads this in the synagogue at Nazareth, he reads it from a text, and he's citing the text there. And it's a text that's a proto-Masoretic text. So it simply says, uh, I've been uh, anointed to bring the good news, bind up the broken heart, proclaim liberty, captive of freedoms, proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then, of course, he stops, and we know prophetically why he did that. One relates to the first coming, one relates to the second coming. But what's interesting is you look at other gospel texts, um, and Matthew, it cites Isaiah 6 and 1, it adds, the dead are raised. And Luke, the same one who cites this text of Jesus in the synagogue, also writes, the dead are raised up, adds that as one of the messianic credentials. Now, where'd that come from? It's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's in the New Testament, but it's not in the Masoretic text. So isn't that interesting? But this is very important, and we'll look at some of that uh, tomorrow. What I want to do is just kind of... Uh, conclude us here. I'll, I'll zoom through this real quick. You'll see all the stuff you had to, we had to miss. But uh, yeah, don't worry about that. That's all right. Here, the last, the last one. Oh, sorry. I, went, I closed my whole thing out. Um, it's there somewhere, but I don't know where. Oh, well. What I would say is the in, in, in summary, the significance or the value of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the biblical study, both Old Testament and New Testament, deals with the transmission and accuracy of the text. It deals with textual variance and textual criticism. In the New Testament deals with the background and the explanation of certain key things that we couldn't find otherwise. And you can see why uh, these words were so important. They're the Word of God preserved for 2,000 years. Uh, but even in the commentaries, things, being the word of men, they, re they also reflect the word of God in citations that help us understand our text even better. And that uh, is always a great value when you have something that helps us understand the word in a way we did not before. Thank you. All right, we have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. You got a question? Okay, I got a question. I'm going to go first. Okay. What value are Fl David Flusser's works for us? Oh. Pull your, pull your, yeah. uh, pull your that down. Uh, David Flusser was a professor at Hebrew University. He was actually a professor of New Testament there. Uh, very interesting fellow. He called Jesus his master. He said he loved Jesus, but he would never claim to be a Christian. And that was because, of course, in the context in which he lived, uh, Christianity opposed uh, Judaism, uh, was looked at as something to identify with Adolf Hitler. It was, it was something socially impure. But nevertheless, uh, he, he wrote from a perspective, particularly about the Dead Sea Scrolls, that they were messianic, they were eschatological, uh, he would say that someone like the Son of Man was a heavenly figure on par with God. You know, he would say these kind of things and write these kind of things. So he put out a, a history of the Second Temple period, a uh, two-volume work. He put out, there's a, a group of his writings of David Flusser, I can't remember the title for it, um, you know, collected works. 
and he wrote a book on Jesus as well. Um, and then he wrote uh, a couple of smaller things on the spiritual, um, kind of the spiritual perspective of the Qumran community. Uh, his stuff is, I think, is very valuable because he's not writing as a typical Jewish writer. He's writing one who is a scholar uh, par excellence. I mean, no one would deny his credentials. But he's writing as someone who really is trying to be objective and, and not caught up in all the debates uh, and just says this is what it says and this is what it means. So uh, to get something from a source outside of our own sources, our own groups, uh, that basically say what we say. And I talked and I, I interviewed him on film and spent time with him and, and we talked, he talked about the Antichrist. Antichrist is a, 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 a from the the Jewish concept. It's from the Old Testament and it was developed there. And he talked about various writings and things that brought out this, this uh, Antichrist. And, and he'd talk about justification by faith and explain how that was uh, in the Qumran scrolls. And uh, you know, many things that were just remarkable that you, you say, I can't believe you're saying this, you know. But he was so oh, here's the evidence for it. He, p he pointed out. So on that level, it's, it's very valuable to use him as a very credible source. Uh, yesterday's uh, slide that went messianic um, outline of the Old Testament using the Ezra or yes. the Hebrew or Tanakh. All right, today, Daniel, you would put him back in the prophets, not in the... No, I said it's where he is today. In, in, in the Masoretic text, okay. as we have it, Daniel is, among the, is not in the prophets, he's in the writings. No, that's what I'm saying. And you would say... You would, right, he's in Kethuvim, but we think he should be in Nevi'im. Yeah. I mean, so, so well, he was, he's called a prophet. But Joshua is called a prophet, too. But Joshua is in the prophets. So this is my question. In, in the Hebrew Bible. We, in, in Tanakh, we don't have Ezra's order then. Uh, in the Masoretic text, we don't. So, but th this is important for hermeneutics. And this yeah. is a new thought to me. Uh, doing this canonical, like, overview view the, where we go messianic yeah. old testament well let me say we have the order the order didn't change but this particular book was moved from one section to another okay so i mean th when i talk about the the gaps that are there and how one uh, end of one section leads to another and brings out a messianic intent yes that that's re remains the same that hasn't changed but th but that that bible x impulse of like look at the whole thing so you can see the parts Doing that yeah. with the order of the canonical arrangement, that's you know, seeing that as prophetic, that it's in that final form, I think for a lot of us, that's a that's probably a new thought uh, to do yeah. a hermeneutics of the Old Testament. And yeah. uh, what would you, what are your, what's your advice about going down that road? Like for example, Song of Solomon, that's going to be a strange thing for most of us to go back to a Christological view of that rather than a, a marital view. Or whatever. well, I'm not saying that every book necessarily has a messy intent. Some would say that. And the practice of intertextuality is what leads you there. As one prophet reads another prophet, builds on those concepts like the, the nets or the branch or the tzemach, in this case, tzemach, the branch. Okay, Jeremiah or, some will, or Isaiah will introduce it in Isaiah 11. And then you'll find Jeremiah talk about the, the branch called the Lord our righteousness, you know. And then, uh, and then you'll have, when you come uh, to Zechariah, the branch, branch up from here and build the temple of the Lord and all this. So this is, you know, clearly one prophet is reading another prophet. And, and that's progress of revelation. And, yes. and so you're doing the Old Testament sequence chronologically. Yeah, but, okay. but you can do intertextuality with many things like that. And that's what I was saying about Psalms 1 and 2 and others. Uh, it, obviously, if David is a type of Messiah, and we see that already uh, from the New Testament, and you're reading this forward, uh, there's no reason not to see it. Now, the question is, how do you control that? What do you do with that? Uh, so those are, th those are other arguments. But uh, there is, I mean, just, just like when you come to Genesis 3.15, okay, the, the, the foundational verse for all of this understanding of the Messianic program going forward. You can see that in Genesis 9 with Noah replicated. You have some of the same uh, parallels in times of what, and you say, what? Well, yeah, this is laid out there, okay? The same context, the same things, uh, but, but a, only a careful exegete would see that. 
and, and read it in the Hebrew text. So a lot of these things have ties in terms of, of Hebrew that you don't see in English. Okay, the same, same kind of ideas. Sparked by words and meanings and, you know, things. So uh, we have to be careful in doing that. But we, but we should do it rather than not do it, okay? Because, it, I mean, he says, I'm in all the scriptures. Right. Okay, now we don't want to do like what the form people do and just kind of shove him back there. You want to see it naturally in the text as part of progressive revelation. Uh, and then through intertextuality, different types of intertextuality, 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 you know, uh, all this kind of stuff, be able to put the pieces together. But uh, you don't want to just say, like, there's a hundred, Joseph is a type of Christ. There's a hundred types, of, and it's never mentioned once. Yeah, and the New Testament never says Joseph is a type of Christ. Now, he may well be. You know, it, it's kind of undeniable, but it's not said so in the text. Okay. All right. Great. That's it. Thank you, Randy.